Hello and welcome. Season four, episode 13 of Duelist Community. I am feeling the wave and certainly very excited about that. Uh, the past couple of weeks, we've really felt a, a shift in, I don't know if it's the momentum in the energy. It all seems to be a bit interconnected to Ray and my uh, journey deeper into ourselves or at least recognizing what what may be happening here uh so yeah nothing but nothing but excitement from my end today i'm in awe every day more and more i find myself in awe because you know it's funny as we started dualistic unity as we got into this conversation i'm not gonna lie as you know i've been on this path for a very long time and so a lot of it was hey here's some review Let's cover some things I've, I've thought about before or look at new angles of things that I've kind of fleshed out in the past. And so a lot of it's been, you know, catching up to everything that I've been doing recently in my life. And recently, it's been so very different in that I don't feel like I'm trying to share things that I've already explored. I feel like I'm actually exploring new territory. And I feel like I'm exploring new territory because of our fantastic community because of the community of people who are involved with us because of what they share, because of the vulnerability that they bring to the table. And frankly, to reference the last time our guest was with us, the community is holding space for me. They're giving me the room and the understanding and the capacity to explore myself without judgment and to be myself and to express myself in an environment where everybody's just trying to take what they can out of it. Nobody's judging me for not saying it perfectly. Nobody is judging me for not being a teacher or perfect in, in terms of spirituality or anything else, because God knows I'm not trying to be. But it really is just freedom. And as, as fun as it has been for me to explore my freedom in myself, it is so much more fun to explore the freedom in myself that's spilling over into the community that's forming around that freedom as everybody explores their own freedom. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. Whether you are part of our community right now or not, you are. If you are having this conversation, if you're exploring yourself, if you want to be free, you are as much a part of this as anybody in dualistic unity. So thank you so much for your journey. That all said, one announcement, just one. We have the Netherlands retreat coming up in November, November 11th to 19th. There are still 28 tickets, but they are moving fast. We've already had six sold. If you would like to join us, the tickets are going to be available publicly as of March 1st, or you can get early access to them on Patreon, as well as discounts for each individual tier on Patreon. There's $50 discount, $150, and a $300 discount. So it's well worth it. You get some merch. You get to talk to us five days a week. If you're not on Patreon, it is the absolute core of dualistic unity and everything that we're doing. On to the conversation that I've been looking forward to all week long. We are joined by Ariel June. Uh, she was here in season two, season two, episode 11, which we, of course, entitled Holding Space. Uh, Ariel is very much in the same conversation that we are in to a large degree. She talks about the realization of freedom. She talks about transformation, integration, which is by far one of the most important parts of this conversation, uh, expression. And of course, the realization of our inner power. So everything that she communicates is very much in line with everything that we are very much trying to communicate, except that she does it in a totally different way, which in a lot of ways I find to be very endearing and very easy to understand. I find the way that she communicates comes from her own life's work rather than just from a book. And because of that, it's easy to apply. So without any further ado, welcome, Ariel. It's nice to see you again. Oh, what a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today and for seeing me, for witnessing me in the work I do. Really grateful for the work that you two do, the community you've built and these conversations you're having. So it's an honor to be here with you. Yeah, super, super excited to have you. I know uh, last chat was was a ton of fun. So would love to hear just a little bit. That was when uh, March 2022. So almost, almost a year ago at this point. So I know you have your own podcast that I think was just starting when I think you had just released or, or maybe had released one or two episodes at that point. You now have a number out there. I was able to to catch a couple episodes this past week. Absolutely love it. I think the conversation you guys, uh, you and your partner are having is is very similar to what's going on on Dualist Community. So I really appreciated 
all of the conversations and the willingness to explore certain things without necessarily clinging so tightly to uh, to anything. Um, so there's a lot within you know what I what I listen to you guys talk about uh, that I'd love to discuss. But I would love to hear just how you've been since you know how how your last year has been, how that podcast is going. Beyond that, um, how your work is going, and just how your life's been. Oh man, <laughs> where to start? This last year has been so wild. Uh, a lot of growth, a lot of learning, a lot of community, a lot of um, nervous system regulation, uh, so much there. But uh, I feel like the biggest piece over the past year since we last talked really has been around, uh, for me, around the notion of community. Ray, I love the way that you spoke to the community you all have here uh, and what you're cultivating to be in a space where you can be with other people who are on this journey um, to like really dig deep into these conversations in a very non-judgmental way. Um, and I feel like that's been a huge, it started with a, a, a large desire of wanting more of that community and over this last year, and especially more recently, really diving into more of that community with myself and my partner and um, our close circle. And yeah, it's really it really is such a gift to be able to be around people where you can just have these raw, honest conversations. So really resonated with that as a theme for the past year for myself. Um, and beyond that, just so much more digging. You two know how that goes. This never ending digging, my own work, uh, supporting other people on their journeys. I work as an intuitive alignment coach. So it's been really beautiful over the past year to work alongside people who are digging into this work as well. And, um, just digging, digging and digging and more and more in community. I feel like there's a million more things I could say, but that that summarizes the past year pretty well. That's awesome. And yeah, I can definitely relate to the fact that every time it seems like I've unearthed something that changes my life, there are a thousand other things behind it. <laughs> so it's like, great, yeah. got to roll up my sleeves and get to it. Uh, I know the last time that we had this conversation and it was a good one because it went on for two hours. I, I know that that episode <laughs> right. was a fantastic discussion, but we talked about deconstructing belief systems. We talked about faith. We talked about empathy. We talked about allowing yourself to change rather than forcing yourself to change. Um, I wanted to discuss briefly one of the videos that you've made recently about the difference between responsibility and fault. Mm. That is very much something that I've discussed. It's something that helped me immensely at one point when I recognized that one is very much me defining myself and the other one is me growing. Um, I was wondering if you would explore that a bit with us. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I would love to. This is a topic that I think is is so crucial. And I think it's one of, I mean, there's so many catalyst moments like within all of the work that we do. And I would argue that one of the biggest shifts in all of this digging, all of this inner work is when you get to the point where you realize, oh, if anything's going to change in my life, I, I have to take responsibility for it um, and, and stop waiting for someone else to make it right. Stop blaming someone else for the ways that it went wrong. And that's a really tricky conversation. I know you two have had those kinds of conversations. And as you know, you start to run into territory that's really tricky because there are a lot of people who have experienced uh, a lot of trauma, a lot of wounds that have gone unrecognized, um, a lot of hurt that hasn't been validated either individually in their lives or societally as a collective. And so getting into this notion of personal responsibility is so nuanced and so tricky. I avoided talking about it for a long time because I don't like controversy and I don't like I don't like poking at people who feel unseen and hurt as it is. And I am, I I've avoided doing that for a long time. And I think it's a really important conversation. And if we're going to talk about what it actually takes to free ourselves and help each other get free, it does require taking that personal responsibility. And so that point really comes to that realization of, okay, maybe so-and-so hurt me. Maybe I had this, this big trauma happened in my life. But if anything is going to change, it's going to be because I decide to take the action toward healing. I decide to take the action toward creating a new way of being. I decide to take the action toward uh, anything other than the cycle that I'm stuck in. And then really nuanced piece that gets really tricky is of course, people end up in those cycles, not because they chose to. And so it's really it's, it's, 
it's not a fair thing in a way, right? And I'm, I'm so curious to hear y'all's thoughts on this um, and how in the language that you use around it. But for me, it's like, it doesn't feel fair. And that's a really big sticking point for a lot of people. Someone else hurt me that caused me to be in this position. But now you're telling me that I have to be the one to dig myself out of it. Like that's not a balanced equal thing. And that is a big sticking point for a lot of us. And it's when we recognize that like, okay, well, I'm the only one now upholding this cycle, that things actually will drastically transform and we'll find a lot more freedom in our lives. So easier said than done. There's so much more nuance to it, but I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on this because I think that this is a topic you're exploring and I love hearing the different language that we use. And I think as we continue to have these conversations in community, we refine and find language uh, that really helps set other people free as they're running into those like wounds along the way of, of finally taking that personal responsibility. So how have y'all approached this conversation? I will start things off. I know Ray has some, uh, some, some thoughts on the word fairness. So I'm going to leave that to, uh, to him, but I think in my experience, this is definitely something that I've evolved with, I think is initially because because sometimes i'll get because i do you know one-on-one -on -one coaching and we do all our groups and we do all all these chats with a lot of people and i think something i've gotten i guess better at is initially recognizing or doing my part to recognize why it makes sense that they're doing the things that they're doing as opposed to immediately right. trying to get them to recognize that they don't have to hold on to it. So, so instead of trying to get to a place as quickly as possible and help them like as much as possible, as quickly as possible, it's like building more of a foundation of, I guess, a sense of, of comfort for them, but, uh, but not, I don't like the word comfort, just, just seeing them for where they're at and experiencing that empathy kind of with them and really understanding and doing my best to put myself in their situation and think, why would I, why would I act this way? Why would I feel this way? Okay. That totally makes sense. And, and kicking things off from there, because then it's not this like fight or flight response. They're not in a defensive mode, like taking it back, like trying to defend the reason that they've been experiencing this for so long, because some people right. have been in that state for a very long time. It could be decades that they've existed in that state without recognizing that at the end of the day, they're the one keeping them in that state. Again, not their fault that they're there, but their experience is their responsibility. So coming at it from a place of understanding, a place of empathy, recognizing why they, they do stay in that state, a lot of times clinging to a desire for certainty because it allows them to feel more comfortable in an uncertain reality that if they have a limited perception of themselves, they feel very alone in. And so they're trying to find the connection through something and they're, they're not really seeing why or where it's coming from. And then it becomes habitual. And then, and then they don't even recognize that there's a way out because it's just what's now what's comfortable, even if it is a strong degree of suffering. Um, and so for me, this is even just in, like in the last few months, this is something that I've gotten better about is recognizing all of that before moving into the recognition of what is what responsibility versus fault comes down to and having that discussion. Um, and then there's, you know, a whole realm within that discussion that I'm sure we'll get into. But for me, it's very much been having that deeply empathetic approach and, and having that whole conversation before ever trying to get into helping them recognize what they're clinging to that they don't have to and what potentially they can let go of. Yeah, it's beautiful. I will add my thoughts to that just because this is a tricky one. It really is because I know from going through it myself, like what I have to change and they don't. There's so many different ways to tackle this. I think it really helps to to try and remember the first thing that that we said in the last episode that you joined us for, which is that holding space is giving them that that place that they can talk to you, that they're not being judged, where they can look back at their past, at the things they've gone through, 
without necessarily feeling like they need to defend themselves. And then when you're in that space, like Andrew was just saying, then it really comes back down to this, this idea of what the world is, right? Because a big part of that idea of fair is unfortunately not based in reality. It's based in commerce. It's based in trade. That makes sense, a fair trade for sure. But reality itself isn't like that at all. And, and so I try to, I try to get down to brass tacks with people at the end of the day, especially when they're like, well, it'd be great if this person could recognize what they've done to me. Yeah, it would be. It would be great. It would feel really good for a short period of time. And you might carry that memory with you. But are you willing to sacrifice all the moments between then and now? Because they may never see it. They may never see it. In which case, are you going to wait? And that's on you. Like, that's the problem. That waiting is on you. And you can, you can change it. You can do something else with your life. You can disempower that entire memory. But you have to do it for you. You have to let go of them. Oh, so well said. So, so well said. It really, yeah, that personal responsibility piece comes in so strongly there where you realize like, oh yeah, I'm waiting. I'm the one waiting. But I love too, Andrew, what you said of um, acknowledging and really, um, I mean, what I hear in there is a lot of accept, like self-acceptance and even a lot of gratitude. Uh, this is one process that I work through with my clients a lot is when we're looking at behaviors of like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I stuck in this pattern? Why am I stuck in this cycle is exactly what you said, acknowledging like, well, when did you learn that? And at that point in your life, I guarantee I haven't, I haven't worked with anyone yet. And I haven't worked in my own process and ever found that that be pattern behavior cycle wasn't helpful at some point, didn't serve a really uh, integral role in my survival at the very least. And going back to that place, whether it's like a memory in childhood or a memory from a few months ago or however long ago or recent ago it was to acknowledge like, oh, that really served me well at one point. And that gratitude that comes from that of like, oh, man, that was me looking out for me. Okay. Coming from that place, as you described, Andrew, I think is so much more um, it's gentler, it's kinder, it's more compassionate, but it's also just like uh, easier than as you said, putting someone in fight or flight and being like, why do you, why are you doing this? And I think coming from that perspective is, is that approach is really important, really. And a gift to give each other, right? We're all just trying to help each other get free to offer each other that gratitude and compassion and understanding is, uh, is so crucial to really to helping each other get free. We're not going to help each other get free if we poke at each other's defenses and then like never talk to each other about it again. Right. So creating that space for each other looks, has to be really gentle and compassionate. Agreed. I have a question kind of going in a different direction, uh, because this is something that I notice Andrew and I deal with more and more. And it's because, well, everything that we're talking about sounds great. Um, we do use concepts to try and communicate that. And every once in a while, somebody will jump onto the concept and forget that it's pointing at a reality that the concept is not. And so a, a good example would be somebody earlier today was asking about being in the present. Like, you know, the way that you communicated, it sounds almost magical. And I'm not sure if I'm necessarily down with that. And immediately we're like, okay, hold on. Obviously we've, we've woven a bit of a narrative here that we need to dispel. And so I just wonder, because I truly do believe this is something that happens all the time. We confuse the concept for the reality. How do you find that you get through that minefield as it were? Because it's so very hard, especially when we're suffering to not want to grab on to something as the answer to that suffering, but it's in grabbing on that we perpetuate the suffering. So I'm wondering how you deal with that. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. So the question is how, how essentially to not cling to the concept as a, a sense of salvation. How to help your clients not cling to the concept. Oh, I think it all comes back to me, a conversation around certainty and our obsession with certainty and wanting the right or wrong answer. And so I find I just have conversations over and over and over about letting go of certainty. That's like the short answer. I feel like I could say so much more, but that's, that's really it. Um, and then on top of that, always is immediate, immediately follows as the, com the conversation around how we deal with the discomfort that then comes with the uncertainty. 
So nervous system regulation. So it's like, why are we obsessed with clinging? Okay, we don't have to cling. Now my nervous system's upregulated though, because I don't know where the ground is. Okay, so how do we regulate the nervous system? And that is a conversation I find I come back to all the time with my clients. I literally had a call with a client earlier today and I was like, okay, did you hear that though? Like what, what's going on with right there with this piece, like this desire to like, hold on. And they were like, oh, certainty, like, you know, it's just something I also like to uh, bring greater awareness to like really zooming out, not just being like, oh, we're clinging to certainty again. Like, how do we navigate through that? But like, hey, can we zoom out even further and notice this pattern of like our obsession with certainty and how do we prepare ourselves because we're probably going to cling to certainty again? So that's the, that's how the conversation goes over and over and over with myself as well. Whether it's my clients or me, I'm like, oh, yep, wouldn't that be nice if we had some certainty? You're OK, though. We don't. As a follow up, and then I'll pass this to Andrew shortly. Because of that, because of the fact that you have to continuously not just remind your clients it's all about uncertainty. We don't really know anything. These are just pointers. But you're also admitting that you do the same, that you have to keep yourself in check, that you go through the same cycle that they do. And you're always coming back to this recognition like, right, I don't actually know in terms of a concept. Do you find, because I find that most people who are in this industry, if you want to call it that, people who are having this conversation, um, they will often try and steer clear of that self-disclosure because at the end of the day, it kind of undercuts the egotistical assumption of them as a teacher and it takes away from their ability to posture. And so to me, it's super important all the time to be doing that, just crushing that idea of me, <laughs> right? Over and over. But on the other hand, within reason, because if you do it too quickly or if you do it too hard, the person who is looking to you for some sense that there's a direction that will work will actually feel defeated. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. how you balance that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great it's a great question. It's totally a balance when you're holding space for other people because ultimately you want them to feel confident that you can hold that space for them and that there is some promise of, um, you know, not certainty, but like that it gets better, that we get more free and that like you're holding holding that hope for them and, and, and are serving as an example of that. I'm not perfect at it though. And I love being honest about that. Honestly, most of the time when I, you know, disclose to my clients that these are things that I still have to work with, the feeling that is expressed from them is like relief and comfort of like, oh, okay, I'm not alone in that. And uh, I, I also, while I say that, say, you know, you just get better at it. It, it doesn't go away, right? Like I, our, our desire for certainty doesn't go away. Like we're working against millions of years of evolution that want us to grab onto anything that might uh, contribute to our survival. And there are a lot of things that contribute to our survival. So we're constantly clinging for things. To undo that in a matter of like 32 years is probably not gonna happen, um, but you get better at it. Oh, the thought comes up, I wanna cling to it. Oh, I wanna cling to it and I let it go. That gap uh, between me and the reaction to wanting certainty and to wanting to cling to certainty just extends and it's like, well, I see the desire that doesn't mean I have to do it. And if I start to do it, I know how to lovingly like pry my fingers back, which actually doesn't look like prying. It looks more like holding space for my, like the terrified child that I am and being like, okay, and then she'll release and let it go. But uh, yeah, so I find that navigating disclosure, especially when working with clients is just balanced by uh, that. Well, that honesty is in balance by also giving them some sense of hope of like, you do literally get better at it. I have evident, years of evidence of that now. It's the same things. I'm just better at it over slowly over time, like any other skill. It's a muscle, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and that balance is is so I can't I can't state enough how important it is. Cause even thinking about it right now, like sharing that you go through something similar to what they're going through can be perceived. You can take it kind of two different ways. Like you could if, if if you're on this side, which I wouldn't recommend if, if you say something like, oh, yeah, I go through that. I have no fucking idea how to handle it. <laughs> like I, I've I'm and, and then they're like, oh, my God. So this might this might never end. But on the flip side, it's not also to say, oh, I go through that or I used to go through that. And now I never go through it anymore. It's like avoiding the the polarities, because if they think that, you know, you have no idea how to how to deal with it, even like to take one step in towards getting a little bit better. They may see, they may have this like 
overwhelming dread and fear that this may last forever. And then if you say that you never, ever experience it anymore, like you never get worried about, you never get nervous about anything whatsoever, then they're like, wait, so if I'm, if I'm not, not nervous, then, then I, and I should be not nervous, then I, there's something wrong with me. And it's like, if you can come at it from, from that sort of middle ground, like I still very much go through that, not quite as often as I used to, it doesn't quite last as long, but it's still there. There isn't the resistance to the experience. It's like, okay, this, this feeling that I'm feeling right now, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's not going to last forever. And there are things that I can do to alleviate it, which really a lot of times comes down to a lack of resistance to it. And so anything that perpetuates that resistance or instills a sense of fear, like that it may last forever is going to take them in the other direction. So it's kind of allowing them to see you as an example of someone who has gone through it, still goes through it, used to go through it, maybe way more. You know, you have all that experience to grab onto or, or reach back to. But then right now, you still very much go through it, but it isn't quite as bad. It allows them to see that, oh, this isn't going to last forever. I don't have to resist it because there's nothing, nothing wrong with experiencing it. It's part of part of this experience, the entire spectrum of all the experiences of all the emotions. It's just, you know, really know, for me, it's come down to how little I can resist those feelings as they arise just allows for the process to continue. And so I think, yeah, for me, that's, that's been the, the best approach to, to handling that is, uh, finding that middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. I totally relate to that. I totally relate to that. Beautifully said. Speaking of finding a middle ground, I wanted to return to something that you had said earlier, and I know that it was uh, something that you had made a series of videos about um, regarding being seen, getting over the fear of being seen. But on the same token, as you were saying earlier, you want to be careful, you want to be empathetic, because you don't necessarily want to say something that's going to rock someone who's in an emotional or in a more fragile state of mind necessarily with something that's too big of a hit over the head like the responsibility versus fault insight that's a difficult insight to communicate without upsetting someone typically but as you may have noticed in doing so you got a lot more att attention right and, and so there's that balance right and so i guess my question is this because this is something that i've wrestled with for a very long time and i've been on both ends of the spectrum i've been that very fragile individual that was upset by everything because i thought everything meant something about me do you think that it is more beneficial for us to walk carefully for the sake of not hurting those people or not, I guess, rocking their boat too heavily because they're in such a fragile state, but in doing so, limiting the amount of impact, lim limiting the amount of exposure that the insights we are sharing can have? Do you think that that's a better idea or... To not limit that exposure and risk rocking those boats a little bit more because it really is a trade it really is and it's it's a balance because on the one hand rocking boats is really comes down to how you deliver too sometimes it's not just the insight you can soften it a little bit so i wonder how much of a consideration that is for you because i know being seen often means being seen by both ends of the spectrum yeah you don't get to decide which end of the spectrum which side of the internet that ends up on when you share. It's so true. I am dying to hear both of your answers to this. So I'm going to turn the question back to both of you. And I'll just be really honest. It's something I've really struggled with. And I think um, for a number of reasons related to my own history have had a really difficult time wrestling with um, because I don't like to upset people. Speaking of the fear of being seen, a big part of that is a fear of like ruffling people's feathers. Um, and there's so much there that we don't have time to get into around my upbringing and being raised religiously and being raised as a woman. And like, uh, there's just so much that I was taught around uh, not offending people and, and pleasing people that I've had to really unpack. And it's difficult to find the line in unpacking all of that between like what feels good and authentic for myself um, of truly not wanting to hurt people and also realizing how much I've held myself back in fear of ruffling feathers. Um, and so 
it's something I, you know, I've been working more recently, uh, the last like a year, um, really spent a lot of time working with, uh, which this is a whole other rabbit hole, we don't have to go down. But the notion of like divine feminine energy, earth element, water elements, um, a lot of spiritual practices around all of those that I've just found really intriguing and interesting. And have been really, really supportive to my healing process. And coming out of that, I've realized how much more um, I feel like it's time to reinstate my own fire and come back to working with the element of fire. And um, that's been a, a more recent, like within the last month or two that I've been like, okay, it's time. Like I feel there's a more balance in this, the earth, the water, uh, the divine feminine, all of that. Um, there's a lot of healing that took place there. And I'm feeling this like draw to back toward the fire and, um, just like totally like shedding fear of, of ruffling feathers is, I would say a part of that. All that said, I'm just going to be perfectly and honest and let you know, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't think that I found it yet. And I love that you asked it. And I love that I now I'm going to make you both answer that question. And so I can learn from you because I'm like actively in process of finding where that line is for me in this season of life. I knew where it was last year, but I don't think that's where it is now for me. And so let me learn from you. How would you both answer that, please? Um, so to so to kick things off, I I don't think it's a line you can find. I think it's a line you have to experience and kind of toe, like like try some things out, test the waters a bit. And uh, through that experience, you find that equilibrium, you figure out where it is. So it's not something you can even necessarily know or point to or kind of like be on the sidelines and be like, I think the line's over there. So I'm going to get I'm going to get close to it. You know, um, that being said, I think I uh, there, there's a few things that have helped me dealing with that. I think certainly understanding that my value doesn't waver helps if i if i put something out there and it gets a visceral reaction cuz i've done that many times and i get many visceral reactions from different people especially you know on the religious side of things um understanding where they're coming from and kind of understanding why people react in the ways that they do helps to see that oh i didn't I didn't do anything wrong. I just, I just said something that kind of questions something they hold very tightly to their identity and they cling to super tightly, you know, as opposed to holding it with that open hand, they're holding on really fucking tight. And so if you question that, it's like, there is, there is already a stress there in clinging to it. And so as you, as you poke that a little bit, it just kind of like erupts by by default. And so understanding that, understanding where they're coming from, understanding that my my value doesn't waver no matter the response that I get, um, understanding that sometimes people who cling to things super tightly, they're not going to, they're going to call you the villain, but it doesn't mean they don't hear you. And sometimes the only way to get through to certain mentalities certain people is to initially rocks and boats i know we have some people in our community who especially have gone back and forth with ray and and they are now you know fucking love the podcast and initially it did not start like that and if ray hadn't been willing to question them or, or say something that goes against something they believe so tightly to be the truth they would have never had the opportunity to let go of that. Um, and so beyond that, coming at it from the perspective of being reality and this all being me, I'm doing everything I can to become more free in myself, you know, Andrew becoming free, but through that, there's a lack of concern for the perception of that. And a willingness to be seen in whatever way. Um, if it means that someone has the opportunity, not saying that they will, but is given at least the opportunity 
to let go of something that is hindering them from recognizing that they're not what they think they are. They're not the story that they tell themselves. Um, and so, and so there's a willingness to be seen in whatever way they need to see me in order to at least have the opportunity to recognize that. Good answer. Um, it, there's so much in this question. I, I think a part of it is um, driven by you and another, another part of it is driven by an understanding of other people. Like I, I am aware of the fact that there is a mentality that I can exist within wherein nobody can help me, where everything is taken personally, everything is twisted into a narrative that is ultimately disempowering because I'm attached to the false certainty that goes with that disempowerment. I'm aware of that mentality and that you can't do anything about it. There's nothing you can do that's going to reach in there and change that person's mind. They have to actually get tired of suffering enough to question the familiarity. That's really all it is. And I spent so long trying to tiptoe around those people because I know what it's like to be there. It sucks at the end of the day, but it doesn't do anybody any good for you to not speak what you know is the truth in terms of how you became free simply because it's going to offend people who aren't who are not willing to be free yet. And it took me a long time to recognize that in trying to be empathetic to those people, I was actually being less empathetic to all of the people who couldn't hear me because of it. The people who were ready for that insight, the people who, who were ready to hear it and do something with it, they weren't even hearing me because I was whispering for the sake of people who weren't ultimately going to use anything I was saying anyway. And so it came down to the recognition that you're always going to piss someone off, regardless of your intentions. So you may as well just do it if you know your intentions are to be authentic and vulnerable and honest and open, because at least then you're doing that. But there comes a point where you can't do that because you're holding yourself back for other people. And that doesn't help them. I feel like I am getting a free coaching session from both of you out of this. Um, I'm joking, but also I truly appreciate both of your insights on that. Like I said, this is something I've been wrestling with anew in the last month or two and everything you just said, Ray, Ray really resonated with me and spoke. I feel like you were speaking to anyone listening, but for a moment I was like, this is just for me and really needed to hear some of that. So thank you very much. And same to you, Andrew. I mean, you both have been very inspiring to me in that. And I've seen some of your videos, Andrew, that have rubbed people the wrong way. And I'm like sitting back, like watching, like, oh shit, here it goes. <laughs> um, uh, and it's been, it's been uh, it, like a, a beautiful lesson to get to watch you navigate that and continue uh, to show up as you are within that. Um, yeah. So thank you both for the examples that you serve of this. I think you're right. There is, uh, we do, we do a lot. We cause a lot of harm when we hold ourselves back. And it's beautiful to be, be reminded of. And I'm not going to lie. I had an ulterior motive in asking you that question because I've been watching your content for a long time. And although you say that we're inspiring and all that stuff, your channel inspires me regularly because I can recognize the fire behind it. I recognize the authenticity behind it, the desire, the intention. It's not egotistical. You really just want to get that out there. But on the same token, you have to be willing to be the villain. You have to be willing to be negatively perceived in order to do half the, the good that you know you can do. That's the only thing that is unfortunately always going to hold you back. And it's that fear. Again, who am I if I'm not this afraid person? Who am I if I'm not thinking about these things? It's worth finding out. And I look forward to watching you find out as your content pro continues to progress. Because again, I recognize the tone. I recognize where it's coming from. There's an, a degree of authenticity that you cannot fake. You can't bring it across. Like you can hear people. And I often reference Phil Goodlife. Hello, my friends. And it's just so goddamn put on. Right. Because it's not coming from a place where it's like, I've suffered and I don't want you to. It's I've suffered and I'm benefiting myself now off of you. And there's a totally different tone. And so when I listen to your insights, when I listen to where you're coming from, I just very much want to keep reminding you, like, don't ever listen to that doubt that what you're saying has value. Like, it's so important that you get out there and just fucking do this and let the chips fall where they may, because everybody who hears you is going to do so much more than those that you're afraid to offend. 
because they may do nothing. In which case you're just walking on eggshells for nothing and you're wasting everything that you've learned just so they don't get hurt, but they're already hurting. There's nothing you can do about it. Damn, that was beautifully said. Thank you for seeing me and for calling me forward in that. I really appreciate that. Really valued brotherhood lately and having brothers around that call me forward in that way. And uh, it's really valuable. And I just feel eternally grateful. I feel like I needed to hear that. And I'm going to go back to this part of the the episode and like listen to it in the morning every day from now on. (laughs) That's Uh, awesome. But uh, I do want to throw this out there because it's important. And I'm throwing this out to the community, to our dear listener who has been joining us for this conversation. I want you to go out of your way to go and listen to what Arielle is talking about in her content. Check out the podcast, encourage her as often as you can, leave comments, like her videos, repost them, do whatever it is you can, because we're going to continue to try and get her back here in our community to continue to talk to us, because this is how we grow. Like Andrew and I often talk about the fact that Dualistic Unity is laughably a podcast. Like it really is just a title for the discussion it's really not a title for the podcast at all. It's about this wonderful paradoxical thing that goes with healing yourself and thus healing the world because they're the same thing. And so every single person who shares the mentality that that is happening in is dualistic unity. They are all what this is about. And so you are what this is about, which is why we were happy to have you back on the show. But at some point in the near future, I would like to pick your brain and possibly throw out the idea of you maybe hosting one or two groups per month for us in our community. You are too kind. That would be a true honor. I would love to be more a part of the conversations. And uh, yeah, I love these conversations. This is what I live for. This is the community that my partner and I create too. We've been doing, I wish y'all lived locally. We've been doing local community dinners at our place and just getting into all of this more. So anywhere that conversation is happening, I'm there for sure. Awesome. I absolutely love to hear that. You will be welcome with open arms as uh, whenever that day happens. But with uh, with the rocking boats, going back to that conversation, because um, I enjoy it, certainly. Um, but I've, I've, found a, I've found a balance with it. But I think... Um, from from where you're at now, I see it as very exciting because there's a lot of people out there. It's not just a content thing, you know, rock and post. There's a lot of people out there who don't feel heard and and are afraid to speak out in a family relationship or a friendship or whatever it may be. And you going into this and and potentially being a little bit more willing to be seen in whatever way that people see you which again doesn't have to do with you there's going to be a whole fucking experience that you have in going from where you're at now to being more at least even just a tiny bit more comfortable with doing so and then there's inevitably going to be people who come to you and they're like i'm really concerned about how this person's going to see me i want to say this i want to speak my truth i want to talk to them honestly candidly but you know, they have such a short fuse or they just react to everything. They're they're They can be very insecure. They're very judgmental, whatever it may be. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to go about it. And you will be able to through the experience of doing it on social media in your life and in whatever means you do it, be able to pull from that experience and be like, hey, I totally feel you. I, I have experienced that quite a bit and I have learned, you know, X, Y, and Z from it. And so there's a whole sort of, I don't know what to call it, category, realm, experience that you'll be able to then pull from, pull from because you went through it yourself. So I, I see this when I, when I have something that I am working on or working through, I get excited because I'm like, I know I'm going to learn a bunch of shit from this. And I know there's going to be people who are concerned about the same type of shit. And I get to a certain place, not to say there's any end point by any means whatsoever, but a place that isn't the place that I'm at now in terms of my perception of it. And I'm going to be able to pull from that. And I'm going to know that it is tried and true because I, I tried it and I experienced it and I went through it. And so it's exciting, especially, you know, as, as a content creator, as someone with a podcast, like there is just a whole realm of experience 
that is waiting to be tapped into whenever you're ready, you know, absolutely no rush, but it's there. And, uh, it's fucking exciting in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you again for the encouragement and the admonition there. I, I totally agree. And it's honestly, at this point, I'm sure as you just expressed, I'm sure you both feel this way. Anytime there's an area that I'm like, Oh, that area needs some attention, needs some growth. I need some reworking of patterns there. It, I've gotten to a point now where it doesn't, it doesn't scare me. Like I'm not afraid of it. I don't try to really avoid it. Maybe those tendencies come up here or there, but for the most part, there is just that excitement. There's just this genuine feeling of like more to dive into, like more to learn, more to grow, more to expand. And the, the promise of the expansion on the other side of whatever discomfort comes first is like so worth it. I mean, it's the same, right? It's like the cold shower every morning, like the first 30 seconds, awful. After that, I'm like, that was fucking great. Let's do it again. Like it's, you, you learn that that initial the, uh, wrestling with it is uh, just leads to so much more expansion and more discomfort, but even the discomfort you start to have a new relationship with. Um, so I totally feel you on that excitement and I feel it. So thanks for breathing some fire or some air onto that fire for me, both of you. Which actually is a perfect segue into the direction I wanted to go because you kind of imply that we weren't going to go there. And of course, that's not how we operate here. Um, <laughs> you brought up the divine feminine and of course, uh, elemental, I'd say magic, but it's symbolism to me. Um, I went through a whole phase of that when I was younger, not kidding, doing the whole ceremony to the four points and the different elements. Oh, I know, and, oh, I know you've been there. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Um, and it's not to say that there isn't value in that, but I think the value is very much personally de derived in terms of symbolism and, and whatnot. And so my question, because again, we kind of share a vocation, let's just say, how do you deal with belief as a whole? Because belief is almost always reinforcing the problem that the person is trying to escape almost always and so it's very tricky because you'll you'll talk to people and they've been raised with this idea of like well you have to respect people's beliefs like their beliefs we're, we're all allowed to have them and to get through that and go right just because you can have them doesn't mean it's something you should hold on to right how do you breach that and 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 again i'm i know I'm asking this because of your mentality when it comes to empathy, when it comes to uh, wanting to understand where they're coming from. But on the same token, there is almost a shell that must crack in order for them to make progress. And I'm, I'm very curious as to how you breach that. Mm. So you mean more specifically with clients than with myself? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest in the, a lot of the clients that I'm working with, and I'm, I'm glad we're going here because I, this is leading into territory that I was hoping to pick your brains about, but a lot of the clients that I work with are a bit earlier in their journey than picking apart their beliefs in, in a certain sense. I personally approach things like, <laughs> I, I think that the interesting around or the sorry, the topic of identity is really interesting. Uh, and getting into that is such a convoluted thing. The notion of identity, the notion of like a single self, obviously, like there's so much that I've heard in the conversations you've had with people around that. And I, I hear a number of people talk about it pretty passionately, like there is no such thing as the self. And on the one hand, I agree. And I think for a lot of people to explore that territory starts with coming back to their own sense of self. And so a lot of the work that I do is um, I like to say I help people who've gotten through survival mode, but then they're like, wait, what, what do I do now? And so they're still kind of rebuilding their foundation around a sense of connection to themselves, a sense of, of their beliefs. And in a lot of ways, I think that that, at least in my process and in working with people, precedes then letting the beliefs go. And I, not always, that's not always the case, but that has been a pattern with a lot of the clients that I've worked with, even in my own process. 
And so what I mean by that more concretely, if we talk about the sense of self, which I think that phrase, I've talked to someone recently that really was bothered by even that I would approach the conversation that way. And that's okay too. I'm ex- I, I'm constantly learning and expanding. Like let's ruffle feathers. Let's rock the boat a little bit. If they're upset with me using the term self, so be it. Um, for me, for myself, if you will, um, when I drop into a deep connection with myself, with my essence, at first there are these layers of who I think I am, but the, the, the deeper you dig into my essence, the it, you just crack open the layer eventually of like my essence, myself is the collective, is that interconnectivity. And that is often the portal that people take to get to that sense of interconnectivity that they take to get to that sense of, oh, I actually can let go of beliefs. And so a lot of the way that I approach it is through uh, less around beliefs specifically and more around this notion of essence. And when we drop into that, the deeper we go, the more we find that interconnectivity from the place of interconnectivity, the notion um, of like not clinging to beliefs, all of that is such an easier conversation to have because you have this almost like prerequisite class of understanding that my essence is all of it. That already expands whatever the, when our minds are like, but I am me and you are you. Like as soon as we can tap into some sense of interconnectivity, having those bigger conversations around even letting go of beliefs and everything else, there's suddenly context for it. Uh, I find. So that's often the route that I take to get there. So a lot of the work that I do first is helping people after they've moved through survival mode, come back to that sense of essence. And then the beautiful part is like watching them be like, wait, when I was meditating and connecting deeply with my essence, all of a sudden there was just this feeling of like, I could sense all other beings there. And I'm like, okay, there, let's go. Let's have that conversation. So that's often the portal. Does that answer your question? And I'm curious to follow up with you, Ray, and also you, Andrew, as well. But since you posed the question, Ray, what that's like for you, what of that process resonates with you and what do you approach differently? Oh, I'm not finished with you yet. I still got another (laughs) follow-up question. I thought I I could get off the hook there. (laughs) No, I love the way that you put that because what you're saying is very much what Andrew and I have said many times, that the mentality of competition, of protecting yourself, of comparing yourself, of all of that makes sense to to do that when you feel divided, when you feel afraid. It makes sense. It's justifiable in that space. But if you don't feel that way, then all of a sudden your brain switches gears and it's operating on a totally different level, thinking of a totally different world. And there are actually relevant insights there because you're in that mentality that can use them as opposed to identify with them. So I I think that's great, but I want to go back to something actually, because this comes up a lot and I lovingly call it the gap. Um, What do I do now? Now that's one of my favorite questions. Once somebody has let go of the carrot and the stick mentality and they find themselves kind of just drifting in reality, like they're free, but freedom's complicated when you don't understand it because you're used to having something kind of dictate the direction for you. So all of a sudden the carrot's gone, the stick is gone, you're just in limbo, right? And, and you're like, I can do something, but why? And so what is your answer to that? Because I know what mine typically is, but what do I do now? Oh, man. I know we talked about having my partner here for this conversation. He wasn't able to make it today, but I'm like, now I really wish he was here. We were literally just having this exact conversation uh, with our community around the dining table two nights ago. Um Right, because there's there's all of a sudden this this notion of a goal or a purpose for life is just out the door. So it's like, well, okay. I mean, and there's nuance within that. I think a lot of people have a lot of opinions on why we're here. Um, but if you let that go, even temporarily, there is this looming question of like, well, what do I do? And I think that one answer is nothing. You don't have to do anything. And if I look at what will happen if I let my life just completely flow downstream uh, and, and get pulled wherever by the current, I'm not, I'm not in favor of that. I'm not in favor of that life. I could elaborate on that, but I'm guessing we all understand what I mean by that in terms of culturally, societally, 
what my life would become if I just went with the current in that way. It's not what I'm not interested in that. Okay. So I'm not just going to do nothing then. So what do I want to do? Take the next step. That's it. I feel over and over. It's like, what's the very next step? Well, how do you know what the next step is? I don't know. What can you not stop thinking about? What do you feel like you'd feel drawn to? What do you feel that magnetism toward at a certain point? It's like, I feel like that's a lot of the retraining of, of all of the work that we do is like, forget the five-year plan, forget the three-year plan, forget the one-year plan, really practical, practical terms. There is this, uh, this movement to like, okay, well, if there isn't a carrot at the end of the stick, there's not this goal, this purpose necessarily specifically to the life I'm living. What do I feel immediately drawn to next? Uh, and I do think that that in a way doesn't require, but it's helpful if we're in greater alignment with our sense of self that we do have with our, what we align with. Um, I'm trying to not use, taboo words here, like beliefs or like self, right? But like, what is in alignment with what, what I care about, with what I value right now? When we're in that alignment, it makes that next step a lot clearer. Um, but I think over and over, it comes back to, for me, and even as I talk to people within my community of just like, trusting where your spirit, your soul, your being this lifetime feels drawn to immediately next. But again, now I'm curious to hear how you would answer that. Or if you have follow-up questions, I won't I won't try to get myself out of that either. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I'm gonna pass it to Andrew first. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, I won't I won't throw a follow-up question right right back at you immediately. But um I love I absolutely fucking love this conversation. Obviously, we have it a lot, and uh it's something that recently I've I've been through is that sort of limbo like what do i what do i do now and i think there's there's so many ways to uh to discuss it and so much depth to the conversation but i think recognizing that it, it's a practice as well is very important like understanding that as soon as you're out of the uh mentality of the carrot and the stick like you're in a completely new mentality and it's like being a baby again, practically. And to think that you would know exactly how to feel okay in that is insane. Like there's no way you're going to immediately be like, fuck yeah, I, I don't, I, there's no reason to do anything. I'm going to do this and I'm going to be totally fine. And I'm totally comfortable in this place. Like that's not how it works. It's like, if, you, if you're a baby, you're not immediately going to know how to fucking work a computer and hold a two hour long conversation. It's like, it takes practice. And and this type of mentality takes practice as well. And a lot of people are avoid even delving into having the opportunity to learn it. They're like, well, what do you mean? I, there's no reason to do anything. I'm just going to go back to this other mentality and where I do have a reason to do this. Cause I'm trying to chase that carrot that I'm never going to get because it's hanging three feet in front of me for my entire life. Um, and so I think I think understanding that there is nothing you have to do, there is nothing you need to do, but also understanding that you are always doing something as much as, you know, oh, I'm going to do nothing. It's like, OK, but that's st you're still lying in your bed with your eyes closed. You're, you label that nothing, but you're still doing that. And so, as I mentioned, it's a practice and I think there's a sense of of comfort that comes from maybe not again not not comfort not crazy about that word but a uh, a level of understanding of how to how to handle the discomfort and becoming more okay with the discomfort and not needing to do anything but through understanding that you're always doing something you might as well do something you want to do right like you might you're you're going to be doing something so you might as well do that why do it why not you can you can pose the same exact question you can flip it on them and be like why not oh i don't know okay do something and then all of a sudden it's not so much about why should i do this why should i not do this what what should i be doing now it's like letting go of the should you start doing things you become more comfortable and not doing it for that ulterior motive anymore because you recognize that no matter what you do your value doesn't waver 
So you're no longer striving to do things because it means something about you. You're just more being the thing that you're doing. There isn't that me doing this. I am in this situation. And if I do this well, it means, you know, the value goes up. If I do it poorly, if I you know fail at it, then uh, the value goes down and, and it's, it's no longer in that track. And so you get more comfortable with it, but that is where the freedom lies. And so understanding that uncertainty and freedom can't be, they, they're always going to be interconnected. Um, so how comfortable can you become with that? Um, and understanding that your value doesn't waver, I think has been a big part for me, no matter where it goes, no matter what happens has allowed me to dive into things that I am more uncertain about because when you're coming from the mentality of carrot and stick, you know, you're uncertain about something. It's like, Oh, it could go terribly. It's like, that doesn't mean that your value drops. Like it's okay. You can just sit in that. You can just be that situation. Um, but at the end of the day, it very much does come down to understanding that it's a practice, understanding that it's not going to be comfortable right away, understanding that it's okay to, to feel like, Oh my God, what, what should I do? And, and allowing that process to sort of unravel and knowing that there's going to be a, a uh, acceptance of the discomfort, a, a becoming comfortable with that discomfort uh, through doing it, through sitting in it, through becoming sort of okay with it without so much of an opinion anymore. Yeah, I love this piece of value, this notion of our our inherent value that you're speaking to. It's such a beautiful model to get free. Like if we're talking about really being caught in the collective dream or really the collective nightmare of capitalism and of like other societal structures that we have to recognize that my value is inherent regardless of how this goes, it not only gets us out of that system of of the, the carrot specifically, but also is a great way to like burst the bubble of that collective nightmare of some of these um, systems that just like are not serving us and keeping so many of us not free. Uh, so I love the component there. Not only a dis- the discomfort piece always, there isn't a conversation we could have where we wouldn't talk about needing to sit with discomfort in the midst of it. Like that's such a, a through line to all of this, but I especially um, really the, the, the notion of our inherent value uh, not wavering is so crucial there. I love that you identified that. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it definitely helps to recognize that your value and your potential are basically synonymous. So it's not necessarily that your value raises or lowers so much as how much of it are you expressing? That's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to go back to kind of what we were talking about here in terms of of belief and and, and what do I do now? Because it, it all kind of ties together and Bear with me as I try and wrap this up into a thought, but the question of direction, right? Like, admittedly, the next step is a fantastic answer, but it still begs the question, but which way? (laughs) Which way do I take that next step? And often people reach for religion or they reach for belief as kind of like their North Star. You know, specifically with religion, it tells you what's good and what's bad, what a good person does, what a bad person does, and you know, that kind of thing. And so you're like, aha, I have a structure, I'm going to follow this, and that's what's going to dictate the direction of my life. But when you start questioning that, you end up, again, in limbo. And so I always find the question of purpose and direction and even God to kind of be one conversation. So in religion, we look at things as good or bad because we're judging ourselves and others according to some ridiculous structure that that's supposed to be, you know, God's rules and whatnot. But in reality, there is no good or bad. In reality, things just are what they are, destructive or creative. It really comes down to our preferences, whether they are good or bad. So that is a terrible way to dictate one's life. And it certainly wasn't the way that was being communicated in any of these religions. What they were communicating was that there are, in fact, two directions towards unity and away from the idea of yourself. So that would be the godly path or towards identity and ego and comparison and competition and greed and suffering and all that other stuff, the path of the devil, as it were. That's it. That's all they're ever talking about. And so what's interesting is that that spells out a whole new North Star. Are you being yourself? 
And how are you being yourself? And this goes back to a conversation Andrew and I were having earlier. And at that point, he's like, I don't think you've ever expressed it that way before. And I'm pretty sure I have. But I'm going to try it one more time. If you were to look at your purpose, you have to look at what your relationship with your life is right now. What is your relationship with your life? Do you feel at ease? Do you feel calm in yourself? Do you feel like you're still trying to be something? Are you still afraid? Are you still fragile? Are you still worried about things triggering memories, stuff like that? That is all your current relationship with your existence. If your purpose was anything, it would be to play with that. So when I woke up to the fact that I'm not my idea of myself, that doesn't mean that my narrative disappeared or all the limitations that went with that. I was socially anxious. I didn't like being around people. I wasn't very a very good listener either, which was probably why I wasn't very good around people. So recognizing that that was my relationship with reality and that it didn't define me, I was able to look at it clinically, step back from it and go, well, I'd like to address that. So I started hanging around with more people. I started putting myself in situations where I had to get used to it, where I had to adapt. Every time I had a thought that pulled me out of it, I'd be like, ah, let that go. That's ruining my relationship with my existence. And so I became my purpose. My relationship with myself became my purpose. And the triggers became a way of me recognizing what I could still work on. Right. Wherever the suffering was, you know, it's as you said, you know, what are you still thinking about all the time? Right. That's a great way of asking yourself, do you want to keep thinking about it? You know, because if you don't, you can change it. If you do go in that direction. Right. But it's your relationship with yourself that really defines your purpose. And as long as you keep that in mind, then the real question is, how much do you want to enjoy your own company moving forward? Not what do you want to do? Oh, that's beautifully said. As you're saying all that, I can't help but thinking, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, right? There's this notion of letting go of the single self uh, that, and, and yet everything that you just said is pointing back to like, well, my purpose is myself. I can understand the tie between the two and see that they're not contradictory. And I would also love to hear you articulate how those two connect for you. I would very much love to do so because this is a, a conversation that we often have because there is a very big contrast between what we're talking about here and your typical non-duality philosophical conversation because they will tell you there is no self, there is no free will, this is just what it is and you're along for the ride. And to me, that's too single-minded. It's too one-sided to hold any merit. Anything that's not paradoxical, it's not worth thinking about. So the fact is, is that you, while you are not your idea of yourself, you are yourself. The idea of you can disappear, but you remain. Choice remains. The existence that you are remains. And that is the experience of the self. The experience of the self not the idea of the self. And so reality and that self are the same thing. You are reality experiencing itself, right? But you are not your idea of yourself, which is always, regardless of what it is, a small limited version of everything you are because your brain cannot fathom everything that you are. It can only pick one thing at a time and that always limits you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully articulated. I'm glad I asked you to expand on that. I was, yeah, keeping up with everything you're saying. And I feel like the way that you string that together is so profound. I mean, we're, it, it's, it's, it's really can be tricky to communicate to people what we're sort of like peeling apart here with the scalpel. Like we're just kind of like separating this, this understanding of the human experience and of the self. And so to separate out like, you are not the idea of yourself, but you are having the experience of yourself is such, it's like, I mean, I know a lot of people that would be like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, those, how are those different? Um, it's so nuanced. It really is. But that was, that was beautifully said. I really resonate with that. And I mean, in my own personal life, it comes back to a lot of that. It's like, okay, you know, over and over there's there's just endless uh, material in my own mind to sit with and to explore. And we have the continuous opportunity to con like set ourselves free and set ourselves free and set ourselves free. And, you know, the more we get connected to the sense of interconnectivity, it's more like, okay, we're helping each other set ourselves free. Uh, 
I don't know where I've landed in terms of the terms of purpose and what I feel that it's all for. And uh, to the point I was making really about taking the next step, it's like, that's where I continue to feel drawn. That's where a lot of people that I work with continue to feel drawn. That's where my community continues to feel drawn. At a certain point, there's this sense of like, okay, I'm just going to keep moving in that direction and know at the very least I spent a lifetime helping myself and other people get free. And it's a pretty enjoyable way to experience this lifetime. So there you it's go. It's a life of faith. There you go. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Ironically. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, just just to go back to the the self no self thing, I'm gonna bring back a uh, some imagery that Ray brought up uh, a couple weeks ago um, in the notion of that you're always yourself and never what you think you are. So I have this this drawing right here. Beautiful. This is this is us right now. So I didn't realize you were an artist. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I love so it. So <laughs> there's 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 us right now. And the reality is that we're all that piece of paper, but we have this perception that we're only the face, but you can't recognize that you're the piece of paper. And again, the piece of paper, pretend it's infinite. There's no, there's no actual edges to the piece of paper. So you can't necessarily recognize that you're that if you're clinging super tightly to the idea that you're the idea of yourself and, and that is it. And so with the with the notion of self, no self, another sort of imagery I like to use is if reality is a blanket and we're all, you know, threads on it, but the reality of us is is the blanket. And we have, you know, the the experience of a a thread, but that in no way is divided from the blanket. Because without the threads, there would be no blanket. And so the radical non-dual approach with this idea of, you know, there is no self, it's like it's kind of like they're denying the entire blanket like the blanket doesn't exist. And it's like, no, there's, there's an experience here now that it's happening. And, and it's not that you don't exist, but just that you're not just you, you're not the idea of you that is limited and, and disconnected entirely from reality. And a lot of people get to that place of the radical non-dual, like there is no self thing because the self is where all of the suffering comes from, but also where all of the, the joy and, and, you know, this whole fucking experience is rooted through the idea of ourself. We like to talk about, you know, with ego, it's the ticket to our experience, the ticket to have this experience, no ego, no experience, no perception of division, no experience. And the ability to have this experience here now is fucking incredible. It's it's awesome, but it's, it's not to say that it should only ever be good and there should be no bad. It's like, no, it's, it's the whole spectrum all the time. And so with recognizing that you are, not only yourself, it, it almost like the walls of you drop and you recognize yourself and everything, but you have a sort of semblance of influence on that reality of yourself in like a, a localized point. And the more clearly you can recognize that, you know, either you're the entire piece of paper or you're the entire blanket or whatever it may be, the more influence you have over that it's like the more you can experience recognize that you're you're that blanket it's like your thread kind of bleeds more into the rest of the threads the more you can recognize that you're that piece of paper the more someone else on that piece of paper that thinks they're just their face has an opportunity to recognize that they may be the piece of paper so it's not from forcing anyone to recognize it by any means it's just from being an example in yourself is like the extent to which you have to go just being that that i've said it before that sample of freedom like when someone sees you they're like oh that is that is a possibility so there is no force there is no desire for them to recognize it but it's just through seeing you in that state they can see that but with the uh just to finish off the the self no self thing the denial, again, the denial of that self is like denying the whole fucking blanket or the whole fucking page. Not to say that, it's just to recognize that you may not be as limited to the thread or to the face as you thought. But again, you're always yourself and never what you think. Oh, I love the analogy of the blanket uh, and, and acknowledging that our own freedom, just living in that freedom 
is recognizable. There's not really a lot to do unless that next step you know, <laughs> draws you to express in some way, which it often does for many of us. But there is just, that's something that I think about a lot is there's this, I don't know, I'm sure you you both have experienced this, being out in the world and you come across someone who you can, you can just feel is really free or really alive, really dropped in, really connected, how, whatever language you just want to put to it. And there's like a moment where you like make eye contact, even if you don't talk to the person, there's this like depth of recognition of like, okay, yeah, I see you. I see you alive. I see you awake. I see you alert. I see you free. Uh, it, and it's this completely unspoken thing. I don't know. Um, I don't have a whole lot of belief around the notion of uh, energy necessarily, but I, I am fascinated by what to continue your ana- uh, your analogy, Andrew, around the blanket, like what we all contribute as we continue to get more free to this, this awareness of uh, each other's aliveness. Um, and uh, I, one phrase that I've used a lot lately that I, absolutely love as it relates to all of this do you two know the artists um allison and alex gray yeah absolutely i know i knew you i knew one or both of you would do you know them too andrew Are you yeah i'm pretty sure ray is grabbing a book right now <laughs> yes yes <laughs> uh the grays are beautiful um i heard alex refer to um their relationship as having a third entity it's like they are uniquely themselves and they've also created this third entity that could not have existed had they not been together, but is this sort of like energetic aliveness that exists because they are together. And I love that notion. You know, that feels like with another person, whether it's with a romantic partner or with a friend or a community member, there is this, like I go around all the time now referring to um, other, like my third entities that I share with other people around me. I think that that notion obviously extends so far beyond just an an individual or like two people's relationship into what you're saying. There's this notion of us all being woven into this blanket and with freedom, with aliveness, with um, however, whatever language you, you want to use around that, the notion of waking up, there is this third entity amongst all of us that's being contributed to over and over, like you said, of the threads kind of bleeding further and further out. Uh, and again, I don't have a lot of strong beliefs around that, but if we're going to talk about the notion of purpose or of like, well, what am I, what am I doing with this experience? It feels like a really beautiful thing to continue to contribute to that third entity of freedom and of love and, uh, aliveness and, um, it's a really beautiful thing to tap into that with other people, even people like you two who I haven't talked to in a year. And I'm like, our third entity is alive and well, you know, we're just tapping into that here. Beautiful. But yeah, I love, I love that blanket analogy and how that ties into all of that. I love everything that you just said. That was fantastic. It's interesting because we have an idea of ourselves as being this, this individual, but the reality is that that's just your idea of yourself. The fact is, is that, All you know is that you are aware and functioning as awareness, which is reality. And so what you're doing and what I'm doing, what Andrew's doing, aren't separate at all. We just tend to think they are because we have a very limited idea of exactly how big we are. Like each different cell in my body is performing a different function, but they're all working together whether whether they're real and they realize it or not. And so the entire universe is you. The entire universe is us. We are all the same awareness. We're the same here and now all the time but there is a very big shift in our mentality that's happening where we're starting to come together and recognize that i know we do have to wrap up here shortly Uh, i do have a question for you but i also wanted to mention we need to get you to one of our retreats one of these days and the reason is because Mm, the depth of that connection that you're talking about we experienced in a way that frankly blew my whole fucking mind at the last retreat because it was for nine days. Our retreats are nine days long. And in those nine days, there's just this progression of letting go. But because everybody's doing it, they're all amplifying each other. It is mind blowing to see how many people can just 
help each other let go when they're all doing it for their own reason. And it's because they're all the same person. They're all the same awareness. And so we are very much changing the way that we operate simply by dipping a little bit deeper into that depth over and over and over again and bringing back what we find into the conversation that we're having with the rest of us. Oh, that's so beautifully said. I will I will have to join you all at some point, honestly. I am obsessed with communal experiences right now and exactly what you're talking about is, again, to use, to borrow Alex Gray's phrase of a third entity, or however else you want to refer to it, there's nothing like when we all gather and have that same intention and are willing to drop our fears, our defenses, our discomfort, or maybe not drop it, but like be present to it and honest about it and enter into like, yeah, I want to get free and I want you to get free and you want me to get free and you want to get free. And we start to cultivate this deep sense. Like I, it's so wild how individualistic our society across the board is uh, and how, I mean, we don't have time. We don't have time today to get to all of it, but the, the, just the depth, the beauty, the freedom that comes from those deep communal experiences. The first experience I had like that really had like that more recently, uh, like within the last year or so, I, I remember just thinking like, oh my God, like here, here we think like these individual healing journeys are so beautiful and so powerful and whatever. But when you come into that communal experience, there is truly, truly just nothing nothing like it. Um, so I love that you all are experiencing that. That's really beautiful to hear. And yeah, I would love to be a part of that at some point for sure. Sounds gorgeous. Absolutely. Yeah, we will get you there one of these days for sure. But um, <laughs> yeah, just to, just to close off the, the discussion of purpose and, and doing it, it's like once you recognize that you're the blanket, just about being the blanket, really. And and in that right. recognition, in seeing yourself and everything, there there is no not to say there isn't no, but there is there is a feeling that's that's a little bit deeper, like a deeper sort of knowing, a deeper sense of what to do when you let go of the idea that you should mm -hmm. know what to do, or there's ever something <laughs> that you have to do. And in regards to community, when you have a number of people who are all recognizing that they are that blanket there's there's something there and it is palpable mm. what's, what's the quote the mm. whole is greater than the sum of its parts something like mm -hmm. that it's very mm -hmm. much the case and it is it is felt in a way that is uh it's tough to even describe but yeah it's it's like it's like coming home it's like being home yeah. really really and yeah. uh yeah it's it's powerful what a gift, what a gift of this human experience to be able to tap into that, that feeling of collective home together. Yeah. And it's incredible how long we forgot it was there, for. which is funny because the word religion, actually, the etymology is to bind together, which I always found so interesting because what we're talking about is the only true religion, which is none. That's what binds us together. I always find that so very funny, but I have a question that I want to wrap up today's episode on because we just recently had a uh, coaching and relationship building workshop for aspiring coaches that are in our community. I know you've been on this journey for quite some time and that you have faced various different parts of the coaching process, building your business, building your name, getting out there, getting exposure, pushing yourself a little bit, getting out of your comfort zone, all that. If you had either a tip or possibly a question for self-reflection, something that has helped you as you've faced these various different hurdles and challenges along the road to coaching, what would it be? What would you leave the members of our community who are very much where you were, say, four or five years ago? Oh, great question. I The, the first thing that comes to mind is not really related to coaching at all, but has been the biggest lesson for me in all of it is to stay connected and to do everything from a place of connection. That looks a little different from everyone, but when I try to go about my business any other way, it becomes, it's so easy to fall back into like the carrot three feet in front of you, like trying to chase something. And for me, like doing everything from a place of connection, like before I start my work day, 
I'm dropping in and we all have different ways of what connecting looks like for us. So whatever that looks like for anyone else, fine by me, but doing that first and foremost and making sure that every touch point of my business, of my sessions with my clients, of videos that I put out on the internet, uh, every single piece of it is, is done from that place of connection. Yeah. Do it, doing it for you, which is not the idea of you, but the you that is also me and anyone you ever interact with. So yeah, Ariel, this has been fucking awesome conversation as I knew it would be. Um, yeah, I mean, people are going to fucking love this episode. We covered a lot and I really appreciate your authenticity, vulnerability as, as, as always that you bring. And that's, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. Being yourself deeply allowing yourself to be that is, you know, the greatest gift you can ever give to reality. So I appreciate you very much. Love your messages. Love everything you're doing. Looking forward to seeing you at a retreat sometimes, sometime too, and looking forward to our next chat very much. <laughs> well, I'll just say thank you both so, so much. It's really, Really, it's been beautiful to have this conversation with you. I feel so grateful for the work that you have done on your own selves and that you're doing to the world, that you're bringing into the world. It's beautiful to know that you two are out here helping yourselves and all of us get a little more free. It's such, such a gift to give back. So thank you for having me on. We'll definitely have to connect more. I am energized by this conversation and feel really grateful to have had this time with you both. So thank you so, so much. Oh, likewise. I can't tell you how exciting it is to talk to people who are quite clearly working on their own freedom and expressing that freedom because that's really all we need because we are all one and once you're free we're all free right it just comes down Absolutely. to how deep that goes so yeah. thank you so much for joining us everyone we will see you next week bye everyone